this is Kyle Bohannon with another episode of the Art of Physical Fitness Show and our first international ed edition. We're here with Kenneth Whaley. Is that right again? Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> All right. Uh, Kenneth, introduce yourself and at, um, tell us why we should care about what you have to say. Right. First of all, Carl, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. And my name is Kenneth Whaley. Uh, at the moment, I'm based out of Brisbane in Australia. I actually grew up in Europe uh, for most of my life. Uh, I moved to Australia about three years ago, so, no, two and a half when I was 19. I'm now 21. Uh, I'm studying exercise and sports science at the University of Queensland. I'm almost done with my second year. I have two weeks to go. Uh, just exams left, so that's pretty good. Uh, I want to do my master's in physio when I'm done. Uh, so that's another two years on top of that. Uh, at the moment, uh, I also run my own business called Performance and Postures, where I work with postural rehabilitation and strength and conditioning training. And that's my passion in life. That's what I want to do. I want to take people out of that initial stage of pain and being able to function normally and without pain in daily life, basically, whether it's sports or just work, being able to type on your desk pain-free. So that's pretty much it. That's what I do. I do a bit of sports here and there, Olympic weightlifting, no gear grappling. Uh, I've done a bit of powerlifting as well. I've played ice hockey, soccer, you know, all those European sports as well. So I have a bit of a sporting background. I'm a jack of all trades. Jack of all trades. All right. Uh, what, we'll just go uh, right into the beginning of it all. What got you into that side of, interested in that side of the physical spectrum of getting people feeling better out of pain i was actually back when i played ice hockey um i was doing fairly well but i had i actually had to stop just because of pain i had so much lower back pain and i don't know i just felt like i didn't want people to actually experience that so i wanted to use my knowledge that I could acquire over time to actually help people not experience the way I did because I really loved the sport and I didn't want to end it. Like I was coaching younger teams. I was playing on two different teams at the same time. I was like, I was all into it. I had to stop. So I don't know. That was kind of what initiated the whole part of me getting into the postural rehabilitation where I'm, where I'm in now. And then I met one of my mentors back home and he kind of like got me into also the functional training, if you can call it that. Mm -hmm. uh, and out of that bodybuilding sort of type of training, as you obviously are first uh, inclined to do, no matter what you do, you hit the gym and right. you do all these fancy machines and stuff, but then you end up in pain again, most likely. Uh, so you kind of got me on the path of more functional training and postural rehabilitation in the gym. And then I started researching more and more on my own, started reading all these books by Stuart McGill and all those big guys. And I've been lucky enough to intern under Aaron Brooks, which is one of my main mentors at the moment. He has a huge influence on me right now. And he's such a top bloke. And, He's got me really into the postural rehabilitation and that's what I want to do. That's really what I want to do. So I've found my niche, to put it that way. So your global perspective um, is reducing pain on an um, individual basis. What do you see as some of like, I guess it's global again, but what do you see are some of the most common ailments that people um, have as regards to posture and that leads to their pain? Uh, lumbar lordosis and thoracic kyphosis. That's the two main things that goes again and again and again all over. And that can be because of an anterior pelvic tilt. You can have a weak glute, you can have lateral weakness, which leads to pronated pronate feet and all of that stuff. But especially an anterior pelvic tilt uh, accompanied by a lumbar lordosis and thoracic kyphosis, that's probably the two three main things that go over and over again 
Now, to all those who uh, don't know all this anatomy like you and I, what is lordosis and kyphosis and all that? So, a lot of lordosis is, I like to use the word duck ass. <laughs> so, you basically have a duck ass form like Donald Duck. So, you have an excessive uh, extension of your lumbar spine, so your lower back. That's lordosis. And kyphosis is in your thoracic spine, the upper back where you have hyperflexion, so you're tilted too much forward, you're rounded over like that. So that's a bit of anatomy layman layman's terms, I suppose. Right. Now, do you find with individuals who um, exhibit that, they talk about back pain, but do you feel also a lot of them have a correlation with shoulder pain as well, with their inability yeah. to function? It's sh shoulder, low back, neck pain, ankle pain whatever it might be, it always has a root, most likely in the pelvis. Like if you correct the pelvis, you might actually see improvements in neck pain, ankle pain, shoulder pain. So everything kind of links together. Uh, it's quite funny and it, it's so interesting. And people are quite amazed when they're like, oh, holy shit, you didn't touch my shoulder, but it's actually better now. Yeah. So. So it's, it's quite fun. So uh, how would you, just very basic person, how would you address something like that? What would be your step number one in uh, correcting that impairment? Step number one, have them just go behind a plumb line just to see different alignments and see any deviations. Uh, so you can look at the pelvis, the shoulders, if they're rotated, elevated on one side, if they have that lumbar lordosis or thoracic kyphosis, pronated feet. That's really easy to look at if you actually have that plumb line. Yeah. And you can see deviations on both sides. And then I have them just walk, basically. Just have a look at the gait and see how that actually, what I found during that plumb line stage, how that actually ties into how they walk and what sort of improvements you can actually make. And during during the sessions, you have them walk all the time. So you can actually see improvements as you go. And other than that, if they can actually function at a level, they're just kind of like being bugged by the pain. They actually have them perform like the FMS or something similar. Mm -hmm. So it all depends, but those are like three main stages actually used. Okay. Now you mentioned uh, shoulder elevation. And uh, I wanted to kind of touch on something I was seeing yesterday in an athlete at, at my gym who came into me and I ran him through a plumb line assessment and everything looks fine. Feet, hip, ankles, everything seems fine, but his right shoulder uh, is dipped a little bit lower than his left. That's pretty, everything else was, symmetry was in line. It was the only thing was, he's a pitcher, or he's a baseball player. He's not much of a pitcher, but um, that's pretty much the only thing that I was seeing. He had slight drop in his right shoulder and also when I had him lay on the ground flat uh, just arms to the side his right shoulder kind of was off the ground a little bit as opposed to his left which was flat on the ground what would your assessment be on something like that without seeing him obviously was he a right-handed pitcher uh he's not a pitcher but he's right-handed it's right-handed okay did you check his pelvis at all yes yeah he yeah, didn't he... so he was not elevated or anything like that no uh then his I would probably say that uh, it would be his upper traps or some of his scapular elevators. Okay. And to have a look at, and there might be a difference there. That might also tie in with, I don't know, the function of his external obliques uh, on the opposite side uh, through those uh, different anatomical chains. But it's a whole host of different. <laughs> right. Different opportunities, but uh, I would probably have a look more so at the upper trap neck area. Okay. If it's not the pelvis. Yeah. Now, um, what is your opinion on things like that where it's all right, uh, make that state that a little better, where a little asymmetry is actually beneficial obviously you're gonna for a baseball player i mean the right side is going to be more developed there's going to be some issues where at one point is it um, a problem or it's a nature of what it is for the athlete and it's fine and you leave it you don't touch it as long as 
is not causing anyone any pain or any sort of contraindications to actually do the sport. I don't see a problem with it. Like everyone's talking about that you need 100% symmetry and blah, 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 blah. But if that asymmetry is actually causing the athlete to be more efficient and perform better, I really don't see why that should be a massive problem at all. I know Eric Cressy, he talked a lot about that actual topic in one of his posts like a few years back where he spoke about an asymmetry in a baseball player, you know, that he works a lot with baseball players and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So, And he just, what he said, that he just said what I said. Like, if there's an asymmetry, and that asymmetry is causing the baseball player to, to perform better, he really doesn't see the necessity of actually correcting it and making everything, like, as close to 100% asymmetrical as possible. So. Right. So um, let's just talk about how you would mold this whole perspective into, into a tr- like an entire training plan or even down to the minute level of just one training session. How do you dress it? How do you structure it? Where in the workout do you put it? Is it all integrated? Do you dedicate a certain section of the workout to it? How do you go about that? Uh, that actually all depends. Uh, I have clients coming in just for postural rehabilitation and I also clients coming in for athletic performance and, you know, just – general being a general badass so uh, it all depends but i always put in it doesn't matter who it is if it's an athlete or an average joe coming in i always put in as fillers something that can correct the posture so if you can put in an lyt exercise for uh, your rotator cuffs and your shoulder blades to make them function more properly in between deadlifts you can put it uh, thoracic extensions in between deadlifts or squats to improve that thoracic mobility and uh, stuff like that. It all depends uh, to be quite honest. So there's no given plan, mm-hmm. but except that I actually put it in, <laughs> right. it all depends on the, the time of the athlete. If they only have 30 minutes, I'll program it at home. So they have to actually do it at home. So they get homework. If we have now, we have more time. So then I'll put it in as we go as fillers. So I try to stick with about three to four main exercises. So you have your front squats, your deadlifts, your clean and jerks, your cleans and all that sort of stuff. And then whatever the athlete needs, you actually just fill in as we go. If they need more thoracic mobility, we'll work on that. If they need more thoracic rotation, we'll work on that. If they need hip mobility, whether it's external internal rotation, we'll work on that in the warm up as fillers. And then we cool down with something else. So it kind of all depends on the needs of the athlete. Right. And that if we have a little bit of time, they actually need to do work at home. I'll say. Awesome. So it's more, I mean, obviously it's, everything is that way where you just fit it to the situation and you dedicate more time to it when an athlete obviously needs it. And what do you feel is a good maintenance level for an athlete who seemingly the function is fine, there's no pain? Um, all those symmetries and everything is fine. What do you feel like is a good maintenance type of a work or um, level? I mean, again, it all depends on the athlete. You know, you have peop- some people actually, they, they recover a lot faster than other people and stuff like that. Right. But on a maintenance level, I would say two, about two to three days of mobility work every week on top of your training and your cool down, your foam rolling and other sort of myofascial <coughs> work that you can do. So I would say two to three days at least for everyone just to recover properly and maintain that proper mobility and staying injury free. Okay. Now let's uh, kind go of, ahead, continue. Now that was kind of like just – some guidelines that I use with my athletes and everyone else that I train. I try to get them to perform either flow routine or some simple mobility drills uh, every day together with some light stretching as well. So So now we're talking about the pain and we're talking about how alleviating it and maintaining it and developing it. How does it exactly carry over to sports? How does it, or for anyone who's not an athlete, who's just 
a general public person, how does it improve performance? How does it make them move function better? You know, pain is going to alter whatever you do. Pain is a sign of something's going wrong, or at least is going to go wrong. Right. So there's nothing you can just push through in that no pain, no gain mentality. That's really not something that I like. Like, you you have to push it hard sometimes to get your results. But if you're an average Joe and you don't make a living of your sport, there's no reason why you should go beyond that stage of pain when you're training. It doesn't matter what it is. If you're in pain, take a step back, look at what you do, and reassess what you do, and then change whatever you do and see if it gets better. If not, uh, I don't know, <laughs> make, it, make it better. Right. <laughs> I mean, like, seriously, pain is just not something you can just push through it's not going to happen there's actually a sign that something's going on whether it's muscular it's in the skeleton in the skeleton sorry and or whatever it is it all depends so i don't know it's really it's a pretty tough question but pain is obviously not something you can just push through right you that's my main goal like you really need to address the cause of pain, not the air of pain, but the real cause of pain, uh, which is actually often your central nervous system, which is quite interesting. So, now, um, since we're dealing now, if pain is not present, but we're dealing with an athlete or something, where how can it? Let's just pick sprinting for example. Um, how can improper posture again, no pain? How could it? impact your sprinting ability so let's say that you have an anterior pelvic tilt which if you're a sprinter you need proper hip extensions to drive uh, forward so an anterior pelvic tilt is often accompanied by tight hip flexors tight calves pronated feet and a thoracic kyphosis and a lumbolidosis as we mentioned earlier yeah and all of that is going to shut off your hip extensors, so your gluteal muscles, your hamstring muscles, and all that sort of stuff. So if you really don't address the posture and get that aligned as close as possible, you would actually <laughs> you would actually just it would be detrimental to your performance and your sprinting ability, and you wouldn't be able to actually propel forward with as much force as you need to. So Addressing that sort of stuff is really, really important. Even if you're a sprinter, if you do Olympic weightlifting, if you do powerlifting, if you are a soccer, ice hockey, NFL athlete, uh, everything is super important. And also in sprinting, if you really can't propel forward with proper hip extension and if you have tight hip flexors, you probably won't be able to get that rip cycle when you lift your hips up and you dive down with your feet when you're running. That's also probably going to be a problem. And then with an anterior pelvic tilt, you might have that pronated feet, which is going to be upon landing. Your foot won't actually accommodate to the ground properly. So you're going to lose force there. Your knee is going to drive in instead of being tracked over your ankle. So you're going to lose a lot of force. Right. <laughs> you're going to lose a lot of force if you don't have that correct posture. Outstanding. That's awesome. Uh, so let's kind of shift the focus from – posture and pain and everything and kind of with the messages with what i try to spread with this show the art of physical fitness how do you blend in your own self and with the, your clients a mixture of body mind and spirit or uh subconscious conscious and super conscious type elements into your whole training philosophy yeah so what my training represents is training for life so for me, I'm all over just training for sports or training to look good or anything like that. I want to be prepared for anything that can happen in life. And I want my training to replicate that. If I push myself hard, I know that I have to be mentally tough. But I also know that, hey, I can't go that far that I actually can't recover properly. Right. And in saying that, all the systems in your body actually link together. 
and the knowledge we have just barely scrapes it barely scrapes the surface i'm pretty sure about everything i mean you have your mental states you have your central nervous system your limbic system your cardiovascular your musculoskeletal system everything connects and if you aren't in the right mental state whether it's at work your passion whatever that is or it's painting that's actually going to affect how you perform and vice versa how your body is in all states is actually going to perform to affect your performance whether it's nutrition your mental state the state of your muscles or whatnot is actually going to affect how you perform so being able to have all of those aspects in training i see is highly important and i don't know it's something that works both for me and for the guys that I train yes i do push some of them to extreme limits somehow then they go home they have a shower and you get a text and it's like hey dude i feel like a million bucks right now thank you so much and they wake up the next morning and they realize hey i actually accomplished something yesterday i did incredibly well i feel so good about myself and then they go out with more confidence they go out feeling better about themselves and that mental state is actually achieved so they feel good about the training and then they come back and they want to put in more effort they put in more effort in work in school in the sport and stuff like that so it all kind of connects together and i use a lot of meditation as well just to reach that mental state and be able to actually relax properly and have control over your own body which is super important awesome i love that dude that's exactly how, like my line of thought i love that um <laughs> yes so um let's uh how, let's just we're talking about a lot of other people how about yourself how do you actually go about training what just down bare bones of it all how do you oh man i just try to have fun at the moment i do my deadlifts i do my squats clean and jerk snatches i flip heavy tires i use sledgehammers i work high intensity i can work heavy i can work light to be honest it all depends if I want to do something, I do. Like I have a structure. I know that I'm going to stick with these and these lifts. If I want to go one single rep until fatigue in a deadlift, I'll go with that. If I want to do 10 by 10, I go 10 by 10. To be honest, I do. I just train to have fun at the moment. Like I've, I just recently got back into a bit of Olympic weightlifting. Right. It's super awesome. Just working on my technique, working on being explosive, you know. And also do no gi grappling. I'm going to start to do a bit of Brazilian jiu-jitsu as well. See how that goes. Probably yeah, I just, I, I've been doing it for about a month and a half, two months now, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I just got back from two hours of it this morning. I'm beat up right now. <laughs> a little more than usual. I just kept on, I just kept getting in there like, oh, let's go again. Let's go again. I was like, ah, fine. It's oh, good every, fun. every part of me is sore right now. It's good fun, though. It's good oh, yeah. fun. <laughs> so I, I, have you... So you do, is that all your martial arts grappling experience is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? Have you started it yet? Uh, I've done no gi grappling for about a year and a half. Okay. Yeah, I've been a bit on and off lately for the last three months just because of university and work. But uh, I'm going to start Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu this week. I have my first gi lessons and see how that goes. Yeah. Uh, that should be fun. I even check, <laughs> at the place where I train, it's, it's not even like a school. It's a... It's a dude's basement, but it's a couple guys, white belt, a brown belt. And um, so some of them wear gis. I don't have a gi. Um, but have you learned yet some of the difficulties of when they start wrapping their belt around your throat type stuff? No, not yet. Yeah, I'll have that... my first gi lesson this week, so we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I'll so probably get choked out all yeah, the time. You definitely <laughs> will. They'll wrap that belt around you so quick. You're like, where the heck that happened? Next thing you know, they're gagging you. It's hilarious. <laughs> See how it goes. I'll let you know. <laughs> All right. Well, awesome. Look forward to that. Um, so to finish up and everything, we've talked about posture and how it affects others. We've talked about your own training. Where do you see yourself going forward? And as far as your own training, for, but also more so your career, once you graduate and receive your master's, what you 
or trying ambition with the with the performance and postures and just the whole broad spectrum of what you're trying to do. So my goal in life, this is what I'm going to achieve. I'm going to open my own facility in the outskirts of Brisbane. I'm going to have I don't know a block of land. I'm going to build my own facility. I'm going to have one path where I can do the strength conditioning part. I'm going to have uh, one sort of facility where I can do my rehabilitation part or my fascial release, manual therapy and all that sort of stuff. I'm going to have a heated pool, you know, all that stuff. I'm going to have one tiny little cottage or facility devoted just to meditation and relaxation all in a rural area so people can actually get out of that stressful situation in the city and just focus on themselves and getting themselves better. So that's my main goal, and that is going to be achieved when I'm 25 or 26. When I'm I, think you've been, I think you've been reading my uh, my diary. It sounds like <laughs> that sounds like my goals. That's so that's awesome. What, <laughs> that's what I'm going to do when I'm done with university. Straight down to the bank, get a mortgage, and then it's all started. Yeah. And then uh, you're and back to your how you you're working with all athletes, but then also general public. You're open to that. Being yep. all, the whole case, all sides, anyone who's looking to get out of pain and anyone. Improve. Okay, outstanding. As long, so, as long as I can help, I'm all good. That's what I yeah. want to do. So, how far are you away are you from uh, completing your studies? Ooh, I'm in my second year of my exercise and sports science degree at the moment. So, I have two more years to go there, and then I have two more years to get my master's in physiotherapy. So, all up, four years to go. But I'll be 25 when I'm done, so I'm still young. <laughs> did you uh, did you spend a couple of years then uh, before you went from I don't know the, the structure in Europe or uh, Australia as far as schooling? Is there a traditional high school where you took a year off or something before you entered in college? Or I went straight from high school over in Europe to university here in Australia. Okay. So I, I think I spent like a month here before I started university just to get used to, get to know the city a bit. And then I was just full on. What kind of made you make that shit, the move to Australia? What pushed you over there? Oh, oh that's a long story, dude. Uh, we got time. <laughs> I can remember all the way when I started grade one in primary school, I remember that I told my mom that, hey, I want to move to America I want to move to the States because I don't know ever since I've been like six or seven there's always been something missing in my life like I had my family I had my friends and everything but it was I don't know there was always that like missing link I really didn't know what it was until I was like 15 or 16 and I was like hey I want to get out of here like I can't reach my goals here I need to move to fulfill my dreams so I actually applied for university in Georgia over in the States. The international student advisor didn't get in touch with me. So here I am, ended up in Australia, and I love it. What school is that that you tried to apply to? Uh, it was actually the University of Georgia. Okay. UG. So studying the same there, exercise and sports science. He didn't get in touch with me, so <laughs> I yeah. couldn't get my Is that the only back. American school you applied to? Yeah, that was the only one I applied to. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. So uh, before we go, we wrap this up. Anything you want to say, finish with, the future of anything upcoming with uh, performance and postures, um, how yeah. they can find out more about you, all that good stuff. Well, you can hook me up on Facebook by just search up performance and postures or Kenneth Whaley. You can also go to performanceandpostures.com to find my website there. It's actually down at the moment. I'm working on getting it up again. Oh, man, yeah. come on. Why is my, it down? My mate just took down the server, so I need to find a new host and all that stuff. And when right. enough, and when enough like Bill Gates, that takes a fair bit of time. <laughs> I'm pretty dumb as dog shit when it comes to that stuff. <laughs> it takes a bit of time to figure out, but I'll get there. Hopefully. And what do you have? What kind of stuff do you have on your website? Is it articles, interviews? What do you have? Articles, exercise. There's a massive exercise library there with about, I don't know, a good two, three hundred exercises you can have a look at. I write my articles, my blogs, I post my training, guest posts, interviews of other coaches, 
David Wu, Jordan Syatt, and a few other guys have been interviewed. So they're up there. So if you're interested in, I don't know, a bit outside of the box kind of training stuff and everything yeah. related to enhancing your performance, that's probably something that you should have a look at. So it's a bit of meditation, you know, a bit of everything there. So I don't awesome. know, the training related stuff. How long did you uh, interview Jordan? Sorry. How, how long ago? Yeah. Uh, a month and a half. Okay, yeah, because I interviewed him. He was on the show probably two weeks ago. Yeah, great guy. I think, he, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. he's going to mention you. Yeah, Jordan's a tough bloke. He's a good friend of mine. So. Outstanding. You guys met at Cressy? Yeah, we did. Did, did you uh, meet uh, Raj Lawson there, too, at, at Cressy? No, I haven't met Rog yet. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Kenneth, for being the first international guest on the show. Thank uh, you everyone, so much for having me. Yes, yeah, outstanding. Hey, everyone, again, his website is performanceandpostures.com. On Facebook, Performance and Posture, search it, right? Yep, correct. All right. Uh, again, this is Kyle Bohanna with Kenneth Whaley, right? That works. Don't butcher your name. All right. Yeah, Until fun. next time, everyone, we will talk to you soon. Bye.